Howdy, it's Kyle talking about growth. And I know we all hate everybody else. Nobody wants people moving to where we live. But despite that, we do have to have growth. But there are only three different ways you can grow. It has to be either urban sprawl, gentrification, or growing vertical. There really is no other option. So here I'm going to talk about the three different types of growth, some specific examples as to where they're going on, and just some of the pros and cons of each. So let's all sit in a circle, hold hands, and grow together. I'm going to start with discussing urban sprawl. Urban sprawl is simply just building somewhere where humans weren't living before. So it can be over agricultural land, over wooded areas, or over big wilderness areas, including open desert. I'm going to discuss two different types of urban sprawl. The first will be large metropolitan areas with a bunch of suburbs. Each one might be growing a little bit. Some might not be growing at all, but it's kind of growing out as a blob in multiple directions. And the other is more where it's a smaller town, just a single jurisdiction that maybe annexes outside county land, keeps growing to its city boundaries, growing, growing out, but it's just one city without suburbs around it. When talking about giant metropolitan areas with a huge aerial footprint on the ground in the U.S., you have to start with Los Angeles. From the west end of the metro area in Ventura to the east end near Yucaipa, it's about 142 miles of constant built-up development. And from north-south, you have Castaic at the north end of the metro area and San Clemente at the south end of Orange County. That's about 108 miles. So to put that in perspective, to drive across the entirety of Massachusetts from Boston to Stockbridge, it's about 130 miles. And then you have New York. The New York metro area has more people than L.A., but because the heart of it is much more densely populated with much more high-rises in the city itself, the overall footprint isn't as big. But nonetheless, it's still quite large. From Peekskill, New York, at the north end of the metro down to Princeton, New Jersey, it's about 103 miles. And then starting from Princeton going northeast to Riverhead, New York, on Long Island, it's about 134 miles. And just like L.A., everything in between all of that is completely built up urban development. I do want to talk about this in differentiation with the Northeast Megalopolis. With that, we usually talk about from about Portsmouth, New Hampshire, down to Petersburg, Virginia, being basically all built up metro area. But within this megalopolis, there are still portions that aren't completely built up, like northeastern Connecticut and portions of central New Jersey. But for, say, New York Metro to go from Peekskill down to Princeton, there really is no break at all. And from Princeton to Riverhead, again, no break whatsoever in urban development. Another huge metro with a large footprint is the D.C. Baltimore area. If you start from Aberdeen, Maryland, going down to Quantico, Virginia, it's about 108 miles. For Metro Atlanta, if you go from Peachtree City in the southwestern portion of the metro to Gainesville in the northeastern portion of the metro, it's about 86 miles. Rockwall, Texas, just northeast of Dallas, to Benbrook, just west of Fort Worth, 65 miles. And of course, there are other megalopolis as well, including the Lake Michigan one, which includes both Chicago and Milwaukee. And basically, the entire Florida Atlantic coast from Daytona Beach south is all built up. So the question has now become, how big is too big, and how far out is too far out? I think all of these are a bit too big in terms of footprint, and all need to be thinking about infill. And this is especially important for cities like Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, San Diego, and Phoenix, ones where the central city is well over a million people and can do a lot in terms of the overall development of the metro area. Okay, so that's a little bit about urban sprawl in metro areas where multiple suburbs are growing at different points. The following will be central cities that have basically total control over how much growth they have. I'm going to go through some of the states alphabetically, starting with Flagstaff, Arizona. There were about 35,000 people at the 1980 census. There are almost 80,000 today. Similarly, we have Tracy, California. There were 18,000 people there in 1980. There are 95,000 today. This is one where most of the growth has been over agricultural land. So in some of the western foothill and mountain areas, you have to be careful about building over wildfire hazard areas. Well, in some of these big agricultural lands, you have to worry about building on prime farmland. Another one worth mentioning is Palm Coast, Florida. This is roughly halfway between Jacksonville-ish and Daytona Beach, and it's really the only part of the Florida coast on the Atlantic side where there isn't much development. But even here, Palm Coast had 3,000 people in 1980, 14,000 in 1990, and has 90,000 today. So the one part of lightly populated Florida coast on the Atlantic side is rapidly being developed, and there really isn't going to be much on the Florida coast at all that's going to be undeveloped. 
All right, now going up into Montana, we have Bozeman, which has grown quite a bit, 28,000 people in 2000, about 56,000 today, basically double the growth just this century. It's both a college town and a gateway town to Yellowstone National Park, so I can see why it's very popular. And then you go to the northwestern corner of the state, you have Kalispell and Whitefish in Flathead County. 60,000 in the county in 1990, 112,000 today. And again, big growth into high wildfire hazard areas. Bend, Oregon, 20,000 people in 1990, 100,000 today. Most of that growth was in the 90s and early 2000s, but it is still growing a lot now. Heading down to South Carolina, you have Hilton Head Island. There was nothing there basically until the 1960s. A few resorts opened up there, but there are 40,000 people living there today. So basically an uninhabited barrier island 60 years ago, now a town of 40,000, a bunch of resorts and golf courses. Perhaps the biggest city in this category in the U.S. is Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It's been fast growth for a long time. 12 censuses in a row with a population growth rate over 10%. And 10 of those sentences, the population growth rate was over 20%. So it's been fast growth for about 100 years, and there are now over 200,000 people that live there. And this is one of many places where it's been growing a lot for a long time, but people are just really blaming the recent locals for all the growth. And the last specific one I want to mention in this category is St. George, Utah. There were 13,000 people in Washington County in 1970, and there are over 200,000 today. And just like how you have many cities in the West growing into high wildfire hazard areas and the mountains and foothills, you have many cities in the Southwest growing a lot where there's no water. But despite the high hurricane hazard in Florida, the high wildfire risk of the interior West and the lack of water in the Southwest, people keep moving there. They're rolling the dice. There has to be a limit to the urban sprawl, right? Part of that will be building on lots or parcels that have never been used. There's going to be some empty lots or a couple of maybe wooded spots within the city that have never been built upon. But for the most part, your infill development in cities is going to be repurposing of buildings or gentrification. There are two major types of gentrification. One that I feel is usually pretty good and one that has mixed results. And I believe good gentrification is when you have commercial or industrial redevelopment. Almost every big city in the U.S. had one neighborhood directly adjacent to downtown in one direction. That was more your industrial area. You had a lot of auto dealerships there, auto repair shops, paint and body shops, appliance repair shops, appliance selling stores. But back in the 80s and 90s, many of the automotive stuff went out to the suburbs and the giant auto malls. A lot of the machine shops closed down, and that left a big hole of empty buildings and warehouses directly adjacent to the downtown. And the reason why I feel this is usually good gentrification is because it doesn't directly displace anybody. And yes, you can make the argument that redevelopment in this area will raise real estate prices just outside of it and can really force people out in terms of pricing. So you can have an indirect removal of people in this regard, but I believe it's a net positive to take all of this formal industrial and commercial area and put it into new use, whether it be housing or new retail or whatever it is, it's better being used as something than just sitting there doing nothing. So I'm going to use a couple of examples. The first one will be Pittsburgh. But of all of the Rust Belt cities, I think Pittsburgh was the first to really gentrify, take some of its older industrial areas, empty factories and things, and turn it into new housing and new developments. And it's by no means been a perfect transition, but I doubt there are many folks in Pittsburgh that have lived there for 50 years that think it's worse now than it was back in the 70s. And there's a similar situation here in Chattanooga. When I first moved here in 07, the part of town called the South Side was pretty rough. There wasn't a lot going on there. It was a red light district, a lot of drug dealers. But you fast forward to today, it's one of the very few parts of the city where I'd be willing to walk around by myself late at night. And so even though some of the housing areas outside of this South Side redevelopment got more expensive and more hipster and yuppie folks started to move in, some of the poor folks that live there had to move farther out, it's still really tough to say that it's not better now than it was 20 years ago. But that's not to say that local governments can't fumble the ball on gentrification like this, but I think if done properly, it can be good. However, the other type of gentrification that has mixed results is residential replacement. And this is when middle class and upper class people move to a low income neighborhood, buy a house and fix it up with the rich people amenities. Most of this type of residential replacement occurs not too far from downtown, and many of the folks that live there have to move farther and farther out. And if you're a family with two cars, that might not be a big deal. But if you were living downtown, walking or riding the bus, now you have to be out in the suburbs where you have to walk really far just to get to a bus stop. 
or you have to buy a car you can't really afford, or just in general make other sacrifices to make up for the fact you're having to pay more to get around. And we've seen this residential replacement from low-income areas to really expensive places in Brooklyn and D.C. especially. But I think the worst I've seen at a smaller scale is Charleston, South Carolina. I do want to show this photo here. This is from the Fountain Square neighborhood in Indianapolis. And this is what I would call bad gentrification. So the question for cities becomes, how do you grow when you're surrounded by suburbs in all directions? Technically speaking, cities don't have to gentrify. They don't have to infill. They can just build up. By not increasing the footprint on the ground, you can add a lot of housing. And I think most of the big cities in the country would like to see some type of vertical development downtown to increase housing. There's certainly a practical limit to that, and not everyone's going to want to have apartment living downtown. But as an observer, I do think there are more people that want downtown-type living than there is downtown housing available. And for just about every big city in the country that I drive through, you'll see multiple cranes building new high-rises, most of which are going to be housing. And I've mentioned this before in other videos, but there are about 30 high-rises going up in Toronto, almost all of which are housing. And I'm not going to get much into politics here, but a lot of times in the city, people that are against gentrification might be for vertical development or vice versa. Maybe they're for infill. Maybe they want more suburban growth, let the suburbs deal with it. But that's local policy kind of stuff, what you're going to have to decide what to do. I can't think of any city in the country that couldn't use both a lot of interior gentrification and new vertical high-rises. But one city that is diversifying its development is Detroit. There's been some redevelopment of industrial sites and warehouses into housing. There's been some new infill development with brand new apartment complexes in areas that were just empty lots or just burned out buildings. And you also have multiple high-rises going up downtown that will have a lot of housing in them. But overall, I would say that all types of growth are needed to some extent. It's impossible to avoid all urban sprawl. There's always going to be some, although we should limit it as much as we can. But you also have a situation right now where people are making the same mistakes they made in the 1950s and 60s with some of the white flight from the cities out to the suburbs. Even though we know that's bad and it backfired then, people are still doing it. So we'll see how much space that leaves in the cities to maybe do even more development with. I hope you've all grown through watching this video and I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve and subscribe to this channel if you're interested in learning more about geography from a nerdy perspective. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out. I'd like to give a special thanks to my superior patrons for their support. If you're interested in purchasing a pin for the viewer wall map or just to support the channel, please check out my Patreon page with the link in the description. And as always, thank you very much.